Hi, everybody. I can see we have a, a bunch of people starting to hop on. Um, if you wouldn't mind just hanging with us for a few seconds here, we're going to give more people time to hop in on the uh, Zoom side. If you're watching this on Facebook, thank you for joining us. Um, Milena will be watching the chat over there. So please feel free to, you know, put things in the chat on Facebook. And we'll still be able to ask Dr. Stacy as we have questions up, pop up. So again, we're gonna get going here in one moment. I'm just gonna wait for some of the numbers to stabilize. So yeah, if you wanna grab some water, some tea, anything you might need, please go for it. Okay, looks like we've started to stabilize. So um, yeah, thank you all for joining us today. I'm really excited about this presentation uh, coming out of COVID with Dr. Stacy Bromberg. Um, to shed some light just on my personal life side of things. Um, I've been able to hear a lot of presentations like this for uh, my wife. She works in uh, refugee resettlement, so a field with a lot of need for, um, you know, compassion, learning about compassion fatigue, all that kind of stuff. So we're really uh, excited to have Dr. Stacy with us, and I'm sure you're going to glean useful information today. Um, just because it is the law of every webinar ever that the host needs to just talk a little bit about what we do. Uh, my name is Michael Taylor. I serve as the membership development manager here at ELV. Um, and we are a 501c3 nonprofit that focuses on the business and admin side. We do a whole bunch of resources because we're a shared service nonprofit, but you know, we really sit on um, child care management systems. And so for those of you on today that aren't familiar with CORE or aren't familiar child care management systems, they basically help streamline all of the back end of your business. Uh, I don't want to eat in today's time, so I would just encourage you to reach out. We'll have some information about us in the post-webinar messaging. Uh, you know, a couple of things I did want to point out with it is um, throughout this pandemic, we've released several pandemic-related items, such as the ability to do touchless sign-in or temperature and health checks. So if that caught your eye, please let me know. Um, finally, as I mentioned, we're a shared services nonprofit, so we do all kinds of resources, all kinds of training. Uh, so if you are not yet uh, following us on social media, I would highly encourage you check us out because, um, you know, weekly we're having uh, guests from all over the field talk about their experiences. Finally, I wanted um, to just cover a couple of the post-webinar uh, pieces. So this does count for training. So um, anybody who registered by the end of today will receive a certificate. Um, and we're gonna send that out along with a copy of all the slides that Dr. Stacy is presenting today. And then also um, a recording of this presentation to you all. So if you, know, if you do have a kid wake up and you need to go take care of that, please feel free. You'll get a copy of the presentation in a bit. Um, but yeah, besides that, I just wanna turn it over to uh, Dr. Stacy. For those of you who are not familiar with her, she is a clinical psychologist who specializes in working with young children and families. Uh, she received her bachelor's degree in psychology and certificate in the neurosciences from Duke. Then she went to St. John's receiving both a master's and PhD in clinical psychology. Uh, she also completed a two-year fellowship in infant mental health through the Harris Program in Child Development and Infant Mental Health at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Um, and she does just a whole bunch more. She's an author. She's a licensed psychologist in the state of Colorado. She provides all kinds of direct services. And uh, luckily, she's here today to just share a lot of useful information to you all. Uh, so Dr. Stacy, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. If you want to feel free to go ahead and do so. Okay. Hi, everybody. And thank you to Michael and Melena for their help. Um, I just shared with them that I'm a little spastic with technology. So I'm going to do my best here to share my screen and get started. Um, let's see. All right. Is it there? Awesome. It's there. So really what today is going to be about is um, you um, and you all. So anyone who signed up, I know that there are some direct service providers, some maybe home visitors, some stakeholders. And this is really designed um, I spoke with Ty Johnson, who's my contact who got me here. And she and I spoke a little bit about the audience and what people were needing. And we feel like coming up on the one year anniversary of COVID really hitting us hard. Um, it's important that we spend some time addressing 
you all and what your needs are and how we're thinking ahead about coming out of COVID. Um, I don't know if other people are having this experience and I don't have the privilege of seeing your faces or the nods along, um, but I, in my personal experience and in my professional experience have been hearing now for almost a year when we go back to things or when we go back or when we're finished with COVID or when we come back from COVID. And one of the reasons um, I chose to focus on coming out of COVID as the title for this talk is it's really important that we all have a collective understanding of the fact that we are not going back to anything, that we are going forward from here. Um, as somebody who works a ton with grief and the grief population, um, the importance of integrating this experience and moving forward is key in order for us to be able to move together as a society in a forward direction. So that's why the title is not coming back from COVID or, um, and is very specific about coming out. And so I'm gonna throw a lot of concepts out today. The idea is to sort of touch on a bunch of them and see what fits for you and your teams, um, what resonates. I have some quotes in here that I thought were important. I have, um, one visual for people to look at. And I really want people to th be thinking about how does this apply to me personally? How does this apply to me professionally? What is something I can bring back to the teams in which I work and in the systems in which I function to sort of help us all move forward um, in a new direction as the world starts to thaw? So the first concept I wanna start with um, and also just for everybody, if you do have questions along the way, please um, send them in the chat and then I'm going to stop every so often and ask Michael and Milena if there are any pressing questions. I'm also going to plan to leave time at the end and I'm going to try to watch my clock here. Um, so the first concept is that of meaning making and in the description of this talk, that was one of the first things that was highlighted. Meaning making is a really important concept in organizing the story of our lives and how we got to where we are. And when critical events happen, how do we make sense of those as human beings? So the way we cope, um, particularly with stressful events is by trying to make sense of them. So um, a lot of my work clinically is with families who've lost a child or who have a baby that passes. And often the question that ha comes out is why? Why did this happen? Why did this happen? Um, and the truth is we don't know the answer. And if you talk to anybody who's endured a significant loss, they don't really like it when people say everything happens for a reason. Um, that's really our society's way of trying to blow past the grief and the sadness. And so I wanna have us all holding this frame of what has happened with COVID is a grief moment for our world and trying to make sense of it too quickly by saying everything happens for a reason or um, God has a plan or at least this for me or at least this for you. Those are all sort of strategies and tricks we use to try to get past the hurt. And so I'm gonna kind of have us hang in there today and sit with it a little bit and think about what it feels like to sit with hard stuff um, part of why people are having a harder time now than even in the beginning of the pandemic is because we're not being afforded the opportunity to move past it and change things up. We're having to still sit with some of the restrictions, sit with the losses, sit with the pain, sit with the what ifs and the unknown. And that becomes really important as we're trying to have our brains make sense of what seems otherwise insensible. So one, one prompt I have out there, and if I had you all in person and we had more time, I would have everyone on the clock and I would say, I want you to take five minutes to write down your story. How did you get to this moment in your life? Start from the beginning and write for five minutes. Um, and everybody has a different sort of story or a path. For me, um, my story started when I was very, very young in terms of always loving children and having a connection with young children and finding joy in spending time with children. Um, you know, wanting to go to school to be a pediatrician, 
realizing over the course of several events, including a very hard interface with organic chemistry that maybe the medical piece for me was not quite right. Sitting with families who were coping with things felt much more meaningful and much more core to my value system. Um, and then how getting to Colorado and how I got there through relationships, training in the Harris program and sort of how I navigated my way to this moment in time, even to the moment where I'm here with you, which is based on a very important relationship that I had early on in my training in Colorado. So if you have the time or you have the bandwidth or you wanna do an exercise with your teams, that's a really nice exercise to show that writing the narrative of your life, and that's how we talk about it in psychology is we create narratives. It's the way we try to make sense and tell the story of what has happened um, and how we got to be who we are and where we are. So for many of you, you chose caring, and this is a very broad genre that I'm including based on the fact that I don't totally know who's on. Um, we all chose some version of caring as our career. And so these are just some ideas about why people go into caring as a career, whether it's caring for very young children, working with families, supporting resources for families and young children, um, sort of these helping professions as people call them. Um, nursing is in there, medicine, social work, um, all kinds of all kinds of professions. And so why do people choose caring as a career path? Uh, the joke we usually make is it's not for the, you know, not for the large payouts. It's more because there's something that feeds our soul in the work that we're choosing to do. There's something that feels good about the work. So caring as a career can be uniquely rewarding. Um, there are other sort of perks in this kind of work in that we get to see the commonality of the human experience, in spite of the fact that people come from very different places. Um, another reward of caring as a career, these really cool stuff go down. We get to see some really great stories, um, stories of resilience, stories of thriving and surviving. Um, we also bear witness to some really important things, particularly when we're working with little ones. Um, seeing a young child grow up is in and of itself a reward. Um, in doing this work, people often will report that they have changes in their ability to have compassion and insight to other people's struggles. So maybe where you once might have judged somebody for how their parenting looked, for example, over time or through your own experiences, um, direct or otherwise, you start to see, hmm, maybe I was too quick to judge right there. Maybe, maybe this makes sense in the context of this person's story. And then often when we're doing caring as a career, we're with other people who chose caring as a career. And so we're with like-minded people who are all working toward a shared vision and a shared goal. And that can feel good. It can feel really good to be working towards something together, um, particularly when it's something that feels like it's aligned with your goals as a person and the things you care about as a human being. Having said that, and I do love this quote, um, the expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and loss daily and not be touched by it is as unrealistic as expecting to be able to walk through water without getting wet. So the people that reap the reward of being in the caring professions the most are the people who also get wet and who are sort of in it with other people. So that's not to say that they don't have boundaries or that they are not professional, but that they authentically and genuinely care about what's happening for people, that they experience a sense of empathy. Um, you know, a lot of people in the old days were trained in, in medicine to not say, I'm sorry, because of the liability that it could incur, right? Saying I'm sorry is an admission that maybe something that you did was wrong. It's really important to be able to say to somebody, I'm really sorry that that's happening. I'm really sorry that happened. Um, this is where caring as a career can get tricky 
because there is a balance between how much you care and how much reward you, re you reap and sort of how wet you get and how in the trenches you feel and how bogged down by the suffering you become. So Michael did a great job of giving me a runway into this, but compassion satisfaction is sort of the upside of what you do. It feels, feels good to be caring. It feels good to be doing the work you're doing. It feels good to feel like you worked hard and at the end of your day, you made a positive contribution, um, especially when you're helping others. Human beings are designed to be connected. So even if you identify as an introvert or a loner, um, even my loners who I support have now said, this is weird. This is weird that I, I can't give somebody a hug or I'm not allowed to be close to somebody. As human beings, part of what has happened with COVID is we're being restricted from our humanness in our desire to be interconnected. And so part of this talk is really designed to remind us that we are all going through something. And though individually we're having a different experience, we are going through something together. And compassion satisfaction for those of us in the caring professions is a huge part of why we stay and a huge part of why we continue to do the work we do. And a huge part of why we say, I love my job. Um, that has been really hard to sustain for people over the course of the last year, particularly when we're not necessarily working side by side on our teams and we're not passing by somebody in the hallway or having a laugh or telling a story or having a cry or sharing in a this just happened moment. So the flip side of compassion satisfaction is burnout. And Michael actually at the beginning mentioned a really important term, which is compassion fatigue. Burnout is sort of the end of the road when you blew right past compassion fatigue. And so I didn't put it on here for the sake of time, but it is an important concept. Um, there's a resource called the ProQOL, and I think it's on the slide before here, on the bottom, proqol.org. That website is fantastic in terms of educating and taking people through the concepts of compassion satisfaction, compassion fatigue, burnout, the interplay. It has a free um, assessment on there where you can also look and see where you rank in terms of where am I in terms of compassion satisfaction? Where am I in terms of fatigue? I wanna go back to the idea of burnout for a moment um, because burnout really is something we're starting to see in the helping professions right around now. And I suspect some of you are having this experience. When I supervise, um, I provide reflective supervision to, uh, to some individuals and groups. And one of the things we're seeing is some of our newer um, psychologists in training and mental health workers are not sure if they wanna do this work anymore. Not sure if they really wanna be a therapist after all, which is a really disappointing discovery after all the school you have to go through. Um, and I'm trying to make sure that people are working hard to discern, not just is it a bad day or is it burnout, but is this a function of COVID? Am I burnt out as a function of COVID and all the repercussions of not being able to practice in the way that I had anticipated or expected or was trained to do? And so, you know, my, my joke that's not that funny is we're all in big trouble when the therapists burn out. Um, you know, it's, it's really our job to take care of ourselves, to be able to hold space and sort of hang in there for the people that need the support. And so burnout is something we're always sort of scanning for, looking for. There are signs along the way that it's coming. Um, we see burnout a lot in the medical professions. Um, medical professionals, and this is a sweeping generalization, so don't get mad at me if you're out there, but um, as a population, don't tend to seek mental health support. So ER physicians, for example, don't tend to seek mental health support only when forced or only when really in bad shape um, and maybe unable to perform their jobs. 
So it's very important that we start to change the culture, particularly now having come through a pandemic from this is a weakness or something's wrong with you to the idea that this is a very normal part of development if you don't have the opportunity to take breaks or to do what you need to do to stay, um, to stay ahead in terms of the work you're doing. COVID has robbed a lot of people who would otherwise be taking good care of themselves from the ability to do that, whether it be the shifts that work is requiring. Um, for me at the beginning of COVID, it was that I couldn't go to my, I used to work out at 5.30 in the morning with a lovely group of early risers um, before work. And that was sort of my grounding for the day. And I would get my exercise in, I would have a little socialization. Um, and that literally turned on a dime. And it took me a minute to reorient. I was just sort of holding my breath for a while. And then I thought, okay, this is not, this is not something that's just going to be replaced unless I am active about it. So I would encourage people to go to that website and take a look at those concepts. For our purposes, I want to think about the cost of caring, which is really what I'm highlighting here. It's not about the fact that you chose the wrong job or you chose the right job, but you don't have the right um, supports in place. This is about the balance of what is rewarding about the work we're doing and what is difficult about the work we're doing. Where is the cost? So this is the visual. If I can get it to go, let's see, okay. And this is not something I'm gonna take everybody through, um, um, except to highlight. Oh. Dr. Stacey, would you mind hitting from current slide in the upper left-hand corner for the visual? Just... Two to the left. There you go. Uh-oh, is that now, it, is it that slide? Nope, nope, start us on the first slide. All right, I'm sorry. Led you astray. Sorry. <laughs> All right, are we there now? There we are. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I don't know what happened. All right, apologies. So for everybody, just to sort of take a look at this and see there's really um, an important interplay of what happens as we are working to balance compassion satisfaction, compassion fatigue, it's impacted by our work environment, the clients that we're serving, what's going on in our own lives. When we start down the path of compassion fatigue and there are more stressors coming in and there are less supports available, you can see how it takes us toward a path of really um, concerning avenues toward burnout. And burnout is not, you know, the end of the road. It's not in any way a death sentence. It is something that has to actively be handled. It doesn't just go away. And you can see why here, because of the interplay, you start to lose the positives as you move toward the right on this. Um, and so when we see people who are headed toward burnout or are actively burnt out, we start to talk about what are some things we can, what are some things we can do right now to change this. Um, people who are burnt out don't know they're burnt out. So it's all, it's similar to, I, I treat postpartum depression often and anxiety and women will not get care. Um, and men certainly don't get care for years often because they say things like, I just thought this is how everybody feels after they have a baby. I had no idea that it feels different. I thought everyone felt tired. I thought everyone sort of wasn't into it. I thought everyone felt like a failure. And so these are important things as agencies and as teams for us to be spending time on. So some immediate things we can do when we notice that we're out of balance in terms of compassion satisfaction as related to compassion fatigue or burnout are listed here. I want to emphasize the importance of sleep. Um, sleep is one of those things that gets like thrown around like, yeah, you need a good night's sleep. Sleep is actually the number one intervention for some of these symptoms. Um, we are supposed to rest. I know that I was not sleeping at the beginning of the pandemic. I was ex 
extremely worried about what was happening. I was worried about safety. I was worried about what's going to happen with my kids. How am I going to do my job? What does this mean? When am I going to see anybody again? I like giving hugs. I was thinking, when am I ever going to get to hug somebody? Um, feeling grateful that I had my people safe in a home with heat and food. Um, starting to worry about all the children that were not getting to go to school and what that really meant in terms of safety for our young children and families who need school, um, not just for the academics, but for our food safety, security, um, safe adults. So sleep became one of the most compromised facets of our health in this pandemic. And so everybody probably knows somebody, if it's not you, who's just not sleeping or who's been waking up at two o'clock every day or three o'clock. I know I was putting my final touches on these at four o'clock this morning and I didn't require an alarm to do that because I, was, I had this on my mind. Um, nutrition, meaning what is the availability to me to be able to eat good food or obtain foods that I like, right? For some people, not going to the grocery store anymore means not getting particular foods. I have a child with um, several allergies. And for a moment there, when we were unable to get his kinds of food, it felt anxiety provoking. Like, what are we gonna feed this kid, right? And it's not that we didn't have resources to be able to get food. It was, how are we gonna get food that's safe for this child? Um, exercise, social connection, spirituality. So over and over again in the research, people who hold faith do better in disasters for the most part. The reason for that, and if you were here, I would say is what, um, but I'll make it rhetorical. The reason for that is there's, there's a narrative developed there. There's a, there's a narrative that exists around I'm working in tandem with a higher power that has my back or is gonna help make sense of this for me. Journaling, even though lots of people don't like journaling and everyone rolls their eyes at me when I say journaling, um, journaling, even that five minutes we talked about has been proven, there is strong research um, around journaling as an exercise that helps organize thoughts and feelings and actually boost your immune system. So short-term journaling can actually boost your immune system. So when difficult events happen or hard things go down, having people write briefly every day um, is the equivalent of some therapy in terms of helping you organize, helping you tell your story, helping you make meaning. Creativity in the context of how are you Balancing satisfaction and fatigue. What are the ways you typically recharge? Um, for some of us, we're not even aware of the ways we had been recharging until they were not available to us, right? What are the ways we recharge, the little ways we are creatively taking minutes for ourselves? And then this last concept um, feels important for today in terms of locus of control. And so some of you may know all about this and some of you may not. So I'm gonna give just the two minute version of this, which is locus of control has to do with where do I experience my sense of agency? So if you're somebody who's sitting around waiting for the pandemic to be over and then you'll be able to feel better, you have an external locus of control. You're waiting on something else. Right? For people who wait on their partner or their teammate or their child to perform a certain way or behave a certain way in order for them to feel satisfied or okay, that's an external locus of control. An internal locus of control is what do I hold power over me right now? So I can't control the situation. What I have control over is my attitude sometimes, right? my attitude about the situation, how I think about the situation, what I want to do to help myself or others in this situation. And so this teeny tiny thing here, because 
I got a little obsessive and didn't want it to loop around to the next line. It just says a hazmat Christmas hug. And I wanted to share uh, just a brief story with you all. And I asked her permission in our last little FaceTime check-in. But uh, Miss D was the secretary of our elementary school when my boys went to elementary school here in the neighborhood. And Miss D, like many in the front office, pretty much ran the school quietly, but she knew everything that was going on. And when my children were having a hard time or my older son used to have a very hard time um, worrying about if there was gonna be a substitute teacher, she would call my phone. I don't even know if she was allowed and now it'll be out there for life, right? But she would call my phone and say, hey, Stacy, I just wanna let you know there's gonna be a sub in Alex's class. Um, so, so that he could know the plan. He's a kind of kid that likes to know the plan. And Misty was beloved by everybody, children, families, because she would do those kinds of things. She was somebody who really did care. She was in early education because she cared about children and she loved children. Um, kids would come up with reasons to have to go to the office just to hang out with Misty. So Misty last year was diagnosed with leukemia um, and it is terribly sad to think about. She's been doing great. She's been taking care of herself. And then COVID hit and Misty lives alone and has leukemia and is compromised and can no longer have visits from us or anybody. Can't give hugs, can't be out in the world. She's one of these people who's really young in terms of her energy. Um, and it was wearing on her and wearing on her. And we periodically have been checking in on Misty here and there. And in our last check-in, just about a week ago, she told me the story. Um, I said, I really miss you giving you a hug. One day I'm gonna give you a hug. And she said, I can't wait. And she said, you know what I did for Christmas, don't you? And of course I did not. Well, she's very, very close with her grandson who is a hockey star who goes to college at 16 out of state. I don't know, he's very famous um, in the hockey world. And he was gonna be home for Christmas and she really wanted to see him and she really wanted to give everybody a hug. And they said, we can't hug you grandma. We can't, we can't, we don't wanna get you sick. You know, we, we haven't quarantined. There's not enough time to quarantine. And so what Miss D did, and this is around locus of control, right? She can't control the fact that they've traveled on an airplane, that they've been around a lot of other people. She can't control that she has leukemia. Um, she said, please come to my backyard. I have a plan. And Misty got herself a hazmat suit and suited up all the way, mask, hazmat suit, the whole thing, and came out and gave everybody um, what I'm terming now a hazmat hug because she said to me, what else can I do? I have control over that and that I was able to do. And then she took off her suit and they distanced outside and they had their visit, but she said, you know, I got my hug in there. So when you think about locus of control, you can think about Miss D and the fact that she very creatively got herself a hazmat suit so she could give a hug for Christmas, not knowing how many more she'll be able to give. Um, and that was really a pointed example to me of locus of control um, and why Miss D is the greatest. Another thing we can do is take inventory of stress. Um, a lot of us say that we do this, myself included, even though I'm trained to do it, and we don't actually do it. So an inventory means spending a minute and thinking about it. Like, how is my body feeling right now? Am I actually doing okay? Am I tired? Do I have any aches or pains? Have I gone to the doctor? When was I supposed to go to the doctor? How long has it been? right? Emotional, how am I really doing? Have I noticed that I'm irritable or a little low energy or really wanting to reach out to friends, not wanting to talk to anybody? Um, interpersonal, right? How am I interacting with other people when it is time? So I have lots of people who are telling me I really, really miss seeing people. And then when it's time to see somebody, even on Zoom, I don't feel like doing it. That's one of the consequences of COVID in terms of sort of keeping us away, keeping us in, having that feel more like the norm. It suddenly feels like a whole lot of energy to meet somebody for a little while in the park. 
right? You have to wear your mask. You have to put pants on. Um, I told Ty before this call, I said, are they going to be able to see me? And she said, yes. And I said, oh, okay, I better put some clothes on. And so she left. I even put earrings on for you guys. Um, cognitive, how am I doing in terms of my memory? So memory is something that gets really impacted by stress. Um, so my family could attest to the fact that I walk around here a lot saying like, what am I doing in this room? And I don't really feel like I'm old enough to be doing that yet. That's a stress response. And then workplace difficulty. So how is your team doing? Are people getting along? Are people helping each other? Or is it sort of every man or woman for themselves right now? How are you interfacing with your boss? How are you interfacing with supervisors? How are you treating your clients or the people that you take care of? Are you really showing up for them the way you would like to? Um, are you doing your best? Do you have it in you to do your best? And then sort of an evaluation of, are you aligned with your purpose? So with all learning, all important learning, there is an element of sort of suffering in that you might come up against a challenge and you might have to push through that challenge. And that's how we learn and we progress. And that's what feels good about challenges. There is a point at which there is less learning and more suffering. And so if you're thinking about your situation, and this is what's going on in some of my supervisions, and you're feeling dread about your day, and you're feeling like, I don't, I don't want to do this again, or I can't do this again. And when you come home, you're feeling drained. And that's what this energy journal reference is about. Instead of feeling rewarded by the work, right? The work is no longer giving to you, but it's taking from then it's time to think about what are the things that are most important to me? What are my values? Why am I here? What's my story about? What is the mark I'm supposed to leave in this world? And am I connected or disconnected? Is the work I'm doing bringing me closer to my value system or taking me further away? And so these are just some metrics by which you can measure how am I doing? Okay, so uh, Michael, I'm going to stop now and Melina and see if there are any big questions or pressing questions. Um, the main one that I, I've had pop up is uh, just over what to do when you're feeling your resiliency um, begin to be tested when you are feeling that exhausted, drained emotion. Okay. And Melina, any from you? Nope, it's just been tie tagging a bunch of people, which is great. <laughs> okay. okay, so some of the things to do are what we just sort of outlined in terms of take an inventory of where are the places that you're really struggling and, and this goal alignment thing, are you aligned with your goals and values? That becomes really important to sort of identify, okay, because most people that feel that way are just like, I don't know what the problem is, but I know I don't feel right and I know I don't feel good figuring out where are the places where I think I'm struggling the most, and then figuring out based on your inventory, what is probably the most important thing for me to tackle. So I'm going to answer every single person who asked me that with, tell me about your sleep. That's where I'm going to start always. How are you sleeping? When are you getting sleep? How is your sleep? How many helpers are you having to go to sleep? So are you having happy hour every day? Are you taking something every night? Are you staying up really, really late because you feel tired from work? Are you going to bed? I know in the dark days of winter at 6.45, I would basically finish dinner with everybody and say, well, I guess I'm gonna go to bed. And my husband would say, it's 6.45. And I would say, well, there's nothing to do, right? Um, and so sleep is a primary piece um, for people that really do like connecting and even for people who don't, reaching out to somebody even when you don't feel like it becomes really, really important. Going outside and reconnecting with the bigger world to remind you that this is not just you alone, that you are out in a world where there are other people can also help. And then for, for some people starting to reach out and say, I think I need somebody to like coach me on this or help me out here. Um, if you have a supervisor that you trust, and if you are a supervisor, I'm going to encourage you to be trustworthy at this time. Um, 
People are often scared to share that they're struggling because they are worried it's gonna affect their job status. Um, I think COVID is supposed to be a free pass for people to be able to say, I'm struggling um, and I can still do my job and I need some place to talk about that. So what is different about now than the typical compassion, satisfaction, fatigue, balancing the energies? There is an element of collective suffering that's happening um, that we have to spend a moment on, which is we are all going through the same event. We are not having the same experience. And so this can get really, really tricky if we don't do this right as a group, meaning as a society. It's really important that people honor and respect that we cannot compare our suffering. So we are all going through a pandemic. How we experience that as unique individuals will be different person to person. And the ways in which we cope with that will be different person to person. And everybody's unique experience matters. Everybody's experience matters. And so part of what has happened, at least I'll speak for me and for those that I supervise is right, we are, we're supposed to be trained to handle stuff. And I have to tell you that pandemic was not one of the courses that I took or anything in my advanced degree or in my advanced training. So part of what has happened is people are looking around to say, what are we supposed to do? Um, and part of what they're getting back is, I'm not sure it's my first pandemic too. So in the beginning of the pandemic, and even now, right, people will say, do you think it's going to be okay, Dr. Stacy? Do you think everything's going to be okay? And I had to say authentically and honestly, I don't know. What I can tell you is I'll be here with you. I had to have very hard conversations. Um, I had four or five clients in the same week ask me if I get COVID and die, who takes care of them? Um, which of course, personally was a very hard conversation to have and professionally is a responsible conversation to have, which is who's gonna take care of me if you get this thing? So trying to be, and that's the third point here, how do I be a worried human being and a good worker at the same time? We are all trying to figure that out together. And so the best way to do that is to say, there are no workarounds here. So in the world of grief, there is no, how do I get over the fact that my baby died? It's how do I get through it? So the only way out of the suffering is to go through it and to endure it. It is easier to endure suffering when you are not alone. And that is true for all people who live in human bodies. It is probably true for people in not, for non-human bodies too, right? We are sort of a interconnected group. So understanding that we're all going through it without isolating one another for having different experiences or even worse, well, mine hasn't been as bad as, or at least yours is not like this. Everybody is having their own suffering. And so what is different about now is we're all doing it for the first time together. Um, somebody mentioned resilience even in the chat. I wanna just throw this out there. And this is one of those concepts that I'm gonna do like a drive-by and have you guys check them out if it's of interest to you. Resilience versus post-traumatic growth. Post-traumatic growth is sort of a newer concept in psychology in terms of how people make meaning of very hard events and suffering. Um, so Michael at the beginning uh, mentioned refugees, right? There will be some refugees who have post-traumatic stress disorder and are diagnosed. There will be some refugees who come out of it okay there will be some refugees who come out of it better than before, meaning they have a new perspective and orientation around the event as related to who they are in the world. And so sometimes when really hard things happen, they force us to take a look at our life through a different lens. 
And so this is not everything happens for a reason. I wanna be clear. We don't wish for anybody to have to endure anything traumatic to have to have post-traumatic growth. Post-traumatic growth really looks more like a new way of being in your life, a new way of navigating who you are in the world. Resilience is I can bounce back from this. I can bounce back to my former baseline. And so the reason this slide is here today is we all have an opportunity to reorient our value systems, who we are, take a look at what we have endured in the pandemic and who we are coming out of it, what our narrative looks like, what is different. So moving forward, right? So not getting back to pre-COVID, which is what everyone was saying for a while, how we're moving forward has a lot to do with our meaning making. So I'm gonna take a minute here. When we lose the desires of our heart, it has ripple effects on the fabric of the rest of our life. Even after grieving our losses, there is much coping work to be done in the form of reweaving our lives, patching the holes of the lost desire, finding new purposes in life when the old ones are gone. This reweaving is a kind of coping that in psychology we call meaning making. And so we all have an opportunity to think about this quotation and think about how the pandemic has affected us individually and collectively and make meaning of it. This quote I found early in the morning um, and I thought it was important to share. The part that feels um, for me, like I'll take with it, uh, I'll take this with me from this talk is without a true transition, change is just a rearrangement of the furniture. So I, like many, would like to just move the furniture around and have it all feel. Real transition requires work. Real transition requires psychological um, reevaluation. So we can change the furniture around and we might have some temporary relief, but real transition requires a different kind of rework. In the, in the path toward transition away or from, it's not linear. So there are gonna be cycles of birth and death and rebirth and death and rebirth. And I don't mean that in the physical sense, but I mean that more in the psychological sense who we are, how we think about ourselves, how we think about the world around us. And so COVID has been a huge lesson in I don't know what's gonna happen. I myself am somebody who does not like to not know the plan. So it's not surprising my son showed up that way. Um, I can't possibly know what's gonna happen. And so what happens when you lessen your resistance and increase the acceptance to not knowing? What is it like as a professional person to say to somebody who's asking you what's going to happen? To answer with, I don't know. And have that be okay. Have it be okay to not know. So these are just some prompts um, and some ideas to leave you with in terms of as you're making meaning of COVID, as we're coming out of COVID and transitioning, what will you take with you? What do you wanna leave behind? So there are certain things about my life that I would like to leave behind. I don't want to be scheduled in the way I had been scheduled. It has been important for me to be forced to slow down at times. Have you actually been with your grief or have you been trying to move the furniture around? Understanding that not knowing is a skill. Being able to say, I don't know, and be at peace with that is a skill. And then what is in my control? So there is suffering. What can I do right now? What do I have in my control today? Instead of focusing on the external. So this is my shout out to Mr. Rogers because he likes kids. Um, in times of stress, the best thing we can do for each other is to listen with our ears and our hearts and be assured that our questions are just as important as our answers. 
This is a slide that basically goes out to all of you who are out there watching or who will be watching to say thank you for the work you're doing. Um, we are in the business of serving. And I do think that the reward far outweighs the burnout potential if we can be on top of it and taking care of ourselves and listening to each other and helping each other make meaning. Um, for those of you that can't see this, this was a girlfriend just sent this to me the other day out of nowhere, and it came right at the right time. And this is from a book called The Boy, the Mole, the Fox, and the Horse. And it says, sometimes, said the horse, sometimes what, asked the boy. Sometimes just getting up and carrying on is brave and magnificent. Um, and then this is just a note from an anonymous person. I took pieces of it on the internet about being kind. So something for me that feels really important in spite of the fact that we're all going through a collective trauma, right? We have unique experiences of what's happening. I have control today over being kind. I have control today over being generous. Those are the things I choose to have control over today. And so if you ever get stuck, so when people say, what can I do? One thing to do is you could be kind. It's actually good for our health and good for the person you're being kind to. And so with that, I think I left us 10 minutes or so or eight minutes or so for questions. Um, if people have questions, I'm here to, here to answer. Yeah, Dr. Stacy, would you mind just shifting back two slides just to the questions? So that way if people wanna think on those and uh, yeah. please feel free to input those into the chat. And you know, while you're thinking on questions or your responses, your takeaways, anything like that, um, you know, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. Uh, so one, again, you are going to be receiving uh, a copy of all of the slides here, as well as um, a, the recording of Dr. Stacy's presentation. Uh, it'll also have her email in there in case there's anything you want to ask or share more privately um, with her. Um, and for those that are providers, you will be receiving um, training credit for this that will probably be sent Monday or later this afternoon, it depends on Melina's schedule. Um, and then also, you know, to just be, I, I like being open with individuals uh, in general. I think my team knows that. Um, so the destigmatization of mental health is extremely important. And as Dr. Stacy has said time and again, um, you know, being gentle with yourself is also very important. So, you know, since uh, November, November, since November, I've been in an OCD relapse and OCD is not, you know, your, uh, oh, I like things to be neat and orderly. It's a bit of a broken amygdala that makes me feel panic and have con constant intrusive thoughts for hours upon hours at a time. It's not fun. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of work to get through, but uh, luckily, I am privileged enough to have been in position to work with wonderful people similar to Dr. Stacy, who are really able to um, help with these things. So if you do feel your brain breaking or anything like that, that's just what it does sometimes. And please feel free to uh, reach out to me or to Dr. Stacy or anybody that might be a help in this time. All right, are there any uh, takeaways that anybody would care to share? I will plan to leave it up for another minute or two just to see if anybody else has anything. Um, oh, we do have one coming in from the Facebook side of things. Um, oh, and I managed to just drop, there it is. Can you expand on not knowing is a skill? How can you sharpen that acceptance of uncertainty? That's an awesome question. Um, the story I like to share is that when I, um, when I defended my dissertation and the panel very appropriately questioned and poked holes in my defense, I can remember feeling actually flush in the face and hot and so upset and anxious that I didn't know the answer. Um, and having my mentor basically see me beginning to implode as a result of 
being asked questions about my dissertation during my dissertation defense, which was very appropriate. Um, and the reason that happened was I didn't know. And I had spent my entire academic career making sure that I knew the answers and making sure that when I had a question in front of me, I knew the answer. And that was the beginning for me of realizing that if I was going to spend my entire life being prepared to know every single answer, I was never gonna be able to be present. And doing grief work where people ask you all the time, why did this happen to me, right? Why is my person not here on earth anymore? I have to, um, I have had to say, I don't know over and over and over again. In becoming a parent, I have had to say, I don't know, or I have had to sit with, I don't know, in spite of all my training and all the books I've read, this little person is a conundrum to me. I do not know. Um, so it literally is a practice like anything else is being able to say comfortably, I don't know. The way to transition toward I don't know comfortably is I don't know, but I know how to know. I know how to find out. So if it feels uncomfortable to sit with somebody and have to say, I don't know the answer, it feels less uncomfortable to say, I don't know the answer, um, but I do know how to find answers. That's something I know how to do and I'm gonna do that for you. And so honing that as a skill doesn't mean you just say, I don't know, I don't know. It's I can be comfortable with owning with you that I don't know the answer and that we're going to figure it out. Is that enough of an answer? Yeah, yeah. It's so weird um, to not see people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I would also add on to that, you know, there's some things that can really help with that feeling of uncertainty or anything like that. Um, there are many different kinds of therapies out there. One that specifically helped me with that is um, acceptance and commitment therapy. So I posted it in the chat, but if anybody uh, has never heard of it, there is a little thing called the hexaflex. And so, you know, when my brain is breaking, that's what we go to. Um, and the one that I really like to think about is uh, cognitive fusion and diffusion. So, um, you know, the way I've had it likened to me is whatever thought you're in or right now, that's not necessarily the reality. That is whatever the reality is. And then you put on a pair of glasses that is whatever storyline that you are in right now or um, series of thoughts. And so just being aware that at every moment of every day, we're wearing glasses that are shaping our viewpoint in a certain way. Now that's okay. But just being aware of it can also help you, you know, be more accepting of those moments. Um, another good question that popped in is, what is your best thought uh, around getting started towards creating a culture of acceptance for going through it? Going through it. <laughs> going through. So I think um, one thing we didn't spend time on today that's really important, and it, it speaks to what Michael's talking about in terms of the, the, lens, the lens we're wearing at the moment, Setting, setting expectations and then managing expectations. So understanding that going through it will mean having difficult feelings and expecting that to happen so that you don't feel surprised by your own emotions or you don't feel surprised when something different happens. Um, so ex expectations are a huge piece of how we feel. So if I expected something, if I expected to know the answer and I don't, I'm gonna have a feeling about that. If I'm expecting to go through this instead of try to work around it or wait for it to pass, but sit with the really hard feelings, I can expect that when I'm sitting with hard feelings or with grief or with suffering, that I'm the kind of person who's gonna to need to be in my jammies with a movie I'm the kind of person who's gonna need a friend. I'm the kind of person who's gonna need extra sleep. I'm the kind of person who might need a day off from work. Um, so setting expectations for yourself and then managing those along the way so you don't feel surprised by what comes, even if you're not sure what it's gonna be. Awesome. 
Okay, well, we are at two, and I do want to be mindful of everyone's time. Uh, so I'll be closing it out here um, very briefly. As a reminder, yes, you will be getting a certificate. Yes, you'll be getting a post-webinar message that has all of this lovely information in here. Uh, you'll be able to reach out to Dr. Bromberg if you have any specific questions for her. And if you, um, you know, have any questions for ELV or anybody like that, my contact information will be in there as well. Okay. Thank you so much for being with us here today, Dr. Thanks, Stacey. I, these are all wonderful, wonderful things for people to always be mindfully aware of. So thank you. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. We'll everybody, see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.